Uh, this is a business track session. This is a non-code presentation, so if you're looking for Drush make files or crazy things like that, this is probably not the place for you. Uh, my name is George Demet. Uh, I'm the um, founder and CEO of Palantir.net. We're a Drupal uh, web development shop based in Chicago. Um, I was also a co-chair of uh, DrupalCon Chicago, member of the Drupal Association, and you might remember me uh, from Dries' keynote this morning. Uh, they seem to have slipped in a picture of me on the workbench slides. Um, so um, I'm here today to kind of talk about uh, the process of building uh, websites, of doing web projects. Uh, so this is really a, a good session, uh, hopefully for folks who are uh, either considering, um, you know, using Drupal uh, for a project within their company or organization, uh, somebody who might be partnering uh, with a firm to do a Drupal development project, uh, or maybe you um, are a, a, a Drupal developer, a freelancer, or work with a company, uh, and you're really just trying to uh, kind of understand what some of the best practices around uh, approaching a project, uh, staying on track, on budget, and uh, ultimately delivering sites that uh, meet client expectations uh, and that everyone can be proud of. So I want to start, actually, by talking about managing audience expectations. And this is a poster for the uh, Tree of Life. This was a movie, I, I, I don't know when it came out over here in the UK, but it came out earlier in the year in the United States. This is a um, film by director Terrence Malick, who makes about one film every 15 years. Uh, and they're, they're always very highly critically acclaimed films. Uh, and you know he gets uh, pretty well-known actors to appear in them. Uh, just beautifully shot works of art, um, but they've never really done huge box office business. Um, and this is his most recent film, Tree of Life, uh, uh, with Brad Pitt and Sean Penn, and um, it tells the story of a uh, family growing up in Texas in the 1950s. Uh, it tells the story of one of the children from that family 50 years later, uh, and it also tells the story of the creation of the universe. And these three narratives are, are, are strung together um, and not really a way that um, would make sense to a lot of folks. You know, you'll be watching the, watching the film, and I'm, I'm not really spoiling anything here, but uh, you're watching the film and you're, you're getting engrossed in the story of this family of Texas and all of a sudden we have a scene about dinosaurs. And uh, so this is, this is an example of a classic art house film. Uh, and it doesn't really adhere to a lot of the, the rules uh, that we've come to expect for Hollywood screenwriting. And so as a result, uh, while critical reception of this film has been really, really positive, uh, for audiences have been widely split. Uh, so for example, um, one theater, in fact, had to go to the lengths of putting up a disclaimer outside the door to the theater where this film was showing. And I'm, I'm going to read this here because it's, it's not very clear on the screen. But it says, uh, dear patrons, in response to some customer feedback and a polarized audience response from last weekend, we would like to take the opportunity to remind patrons that The Tree of Life is a uniquely visionary and deeply philosophical film from an auteur director. It does not follow a traditional linear narrative approach to storytelling. We encourage patrons to read up on the film before choosing to see it, and for those electing to attend, please go in with an open mind and know that the Avon has a no refund policy once you have purchased a ticket to see one of our films. The Avon stands behind this ambitious uh, work of art and other challenging films which define us as a true art house cinema, and we hope you will expand your horizons with us. Thank you. So I love this disclaimer, uh, one, because it's kind of condescending as all hell. <laughs> But it really does, I think, bring home the point that um, I think a lot of us consider ourselves very, very creative folks, and, and there's a, often a desire to really push the envelope, break the rules, and do something different. And I think that's absolutely wonderful, and I think folks should do that. Um, but when you're thinking in terms of a, a client project, a project where you're 
getting paid uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a site for somebody, you really want to make sure that they know what you uh, what to expect going into the process and that they know what they're going to get when they at the end of it. Uh, because if it's not what they expect, they're going to be pretty unhappy. Which leads into my point about the cost of failure. Uh, and this is the movie Cutthroat Island. Uh, has anyone in this room actually seen the movie Cutthroat Island? A couple folks. Has any, did anyone see Cutthroat Island in the movie theater when it came out? That's what I thought. So uh, this movie uh, came from uh, Carl Co. Pictures, which was known for doing uh, Terminator 2. Uh, I think they did uh, the first two Rambo movies. They had done some, some pretty big films. And, um, you know, big box office successes. Uh, so they, they, they did this film, uh, Cutthroat Island. Uh, it cost $115 million back in 1995, which was a big chunk of change for uh, a movie budget those days. It's still a pretty big chunk of change for a movie budget, but uh, it was a lot back then. And it had a box office of only $10 million. So they lost over $100 million on this movie. Um, and I, it was just incredibly unpopular. Uh, no one went to see it. And uh, it was kind of a mess of a movie. Um, I mean, it's not the worst movie I've ever seen, but it's not great either. It's certainly not something you would expect from that kind of investment and the kind of star power and the kind of uh, you know, caliber of filmmakers that were behind it. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that um, production on this film was incredibly rushed, and they actually started building sets and shooting scenes before they had finished the script. Uh, so they were in this position where they were literally just kind of making it up as they went along. Um, and the result was uh, that it ended up bankrupting uh, Carl Co. Pictures. And in a broader context, it also meant that because this was a movie about pirates, no other Hollywood studio wanted to go anywhere near any movie about pirates. Uh, and in fact, it was eight years later uh, that Pirates of the Caribbean with Johnny Depp was really the first major pirate movie uh, since this particular debacle. And I, and I think this makes, uh, you know, again, a really good point about going into the process with a plan, knowing what you're doing, particularly if you're dealing with a large project, uh, and making sure that you don't end up with a cutthroat island on your hands. So let's talk a little bit about the Hollywood storytelling formula. Um, you know, those of you who, you know, go to see Hollywood movies, if might have noticed that there's, there's kind of a, a, a similar structure to them in terms of the storytelling. In fact, it's a very deliberate structure. This is uh, the basic film, the three-act Hollywood structure. Uh, it was uh, really a guy named Sid Field uh, back in the 70s, a uh, screenwriter. He teaches screenwriting classes. He was the one who really kind of diagrammed this out. Um, this, this structure actually comes from um, it has its roots in, in um, Aristotle, um, you know, and it's been, been carried through the century. Sometimes it's a three-act structure, sometimes it's a five-act structure, um, but generally it's the same sort of idea, uh, that you have this basic film paradigm. And about 90 to 95 percent of the scripts that are made in Hollywood adhere to this formula. And in fact, movie producers will often um, when they're reviewing a script, what they'll do is they'll actually go through to particular points in the script to see if there is a, pop, a plot point change. Um, you know, and if it's not there, they, they will just kind of reject the script if it doesn't meet this formula because all of the most popular box office films adhere to this. So let me, let me explain a little bit further. Let's, in the context of a film um, that hopefully folks have seen called The Matrix. Uh, so you start off with the setup. Um, the setup in this case is um, we meet uh, Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, ordinary office drone who's a hacker on his off time. Uh, he gets mixed up with Trinity and the rest of the gang and finds himself on the run from mysterious uh, agents. So there's big plot point number one, where, where Neo has to make a decision. Does he take the red pill or the blue pill? And uh, he ends up taking, uh, uh, taking the pill, the red pill, and he sees how deep the rabbit hole goes. 
During the second uh, act of the film, uh, Neo is introduced to the Matrix. Uh, he uh, learns about the conflict between man and machines uh, in this virtual world of the Matrix. Uh, he, he trains up, he learns Kung Fu. This is all building, building, building to the third major plot point, which is uh, when uh, Cypher betrays Morpheus uh, who's then taken captive, and Neo has to again make a decision, and he makes the decision to try to go and rescue Morpheus. And then the third act is, is uh, full of your, your big action uh, set pieces, uh, the big rescue sequence, uh, and it's where uh, uh, Neo uh, kind of realizes his powers and, and becomes uh, Superman, basically. So it's, it's this is a film that adheres very closely to the structure. And, and, and if, you, if you go back and if you watch movies, you can really kind of fast forward to about 20 minutes into a film, uh, fast forward to about 20 minutes before the end of a film, and you'll see these kind of major plot points. And as I was thinking about this Hollywood structure, uh, I, I realized that it had some parallels to what we do um, in, this, in the web development cycle. So we start out with the discovery and design phase. Uh, we have a, a key deliverable at the end of that uh, phase, uh, you know, a, a functional specification, a feature list, or a feature narrative and design. Uh, we have this big middle segment where we're going through the development process. Uh, we get to a major point, which is the beta release. That's the feature complete version of the site that we've been building. And then we have this final act that's, that's full of all kinds of action and explosions and things going back and forth, quality assurance, right, before a launch. So let's walk through what that looks like for a single project. Uh, this is a project that we did recently for uh, Minnesota Public Radio. Uh, this is the uh, MPR archive. Uh, so this is uh, essentially a site where you can go and, and search through uh, almost all of Minnesota Public Radio's uh, archive of recordings and news reports and things like that. You can hear uh, stuff, Hubert Humphrey uh, uh, speeches. You can go back, you can hear uh, recordings from when Garrison Keillor uh, uh, was a morning DJ. All sorts of stuff that uh, would be very familiar to anyone who uh, listens to public radio in America. So this is what um, the finished site actually looks like. So let's walk through the process of how that was built. So we had act one, discovery strategy and design. Uh, key points here, uh, obviously listen to the client, involve stakeholders, understand what the business needs of the site are. Develop a feature narrative. What are the features that are gonna be on the site? What is it gonna take to build those features based on the business requirements that you've gathered? Uh, wireframe the site. What is, what is the kind of skeleton of the site gonna look like? Create a style guide that really dictates the look and feel of the site and the user interactions. And you have some key players during the stage, right? You've got a strategist who's responsible for the uh, gathering the business needs, tech lead who's kind of the person in charge of the technical team that's gonna be responsible for uh, implementing this. Uh, that person is also uh, working with the strategist to try to understand how to translate some of these desired features into something that's actually buildable uh, you have a designer or a user experience person uh, who's helping develop the look and feel. This could be somebody you're collaborating with as well. And you have a project manager whose uh, job it is to kind of coordinate all of these different players and make sure that everyone is on the same page. So the feature narrative, which is one of the deliverables uh, of this phase, uh, is a narrative document that outlines the site functionality and the technical approach to implementing it in Drupal. Um, it's it's a big, long document. Uh, it's got a list of all the features associated with the project, the level of effort associated with each one. And this is really a key decision-making tool for clients when they're prioritizing features against budget and timeline. And it's also a really great tool for uh, the developers to really begin to dig in and understand what it is that they're gonna be building for this project, not just what it is they're gonna be building, but why it is that they're going to be building it. So let's take a look at uh, the uh, the section of the feature narrative for uh, the Minnesota Public Radio, we're just gonna really primarily be looking at the homepage during this. Uh, so we've talked about level of effort, 
24 hours to build. Summary, this is what this thing is going to do. Important that this be written in plain English that the client can understand. Um, details, uh, uh, this is where the functionality is going, uh, what the function, the details, what the functionality is going to be, where it's going to appear. Uh, we've referenced uh, the wireframes and designs, which we'll be looking at in a bit. And if there are any other features that are related to it, uh, oftentimes you'll have one feature that interacts with another feature in a different way. And we do this for every single feature on the site. And um, what this does is it enables the client to say, okay, you know, I've got this big, huge laundry list of things I want to do with the site. Oftentimes that laundry list is a lot more than what they have in their budget or timeline. And, but by going through and doing this for every single feature, they can take a look and say, okay, this feature is really, really important, so we're going to prioritize it. We're going to make sure we build it. This other feature would be nice to have, but it really, if I have to spend you know, an extra X amount of money and take an extra you know, X amount of weeks on the project, that can probably wait till phase two. So this is a, a very useful tool for the client from that respect. The wireframes, um, the wireframes help a number of folks. They help the designer who's going to be responsible for the look and feel understand what the functionality is that's going to be on the site, how it's going to work. Uh, it helps the developer understand the context for this functionality that they've just spec'd. Helps the themer understand what regions are going to be used on the site before they begin theming. And, and it's also a useful tool for the client to really understand kind of how are the different pieces going to fit together. So let's take a look. So these are the wireframes for that Minnesota Public Radio site. Uh, you can see we're, we're not doing any branding here. We're not talking about colors, typography, anything like that. This is pretty much, we got a little bit of typography, I guess. Uh, but uh, this is really just kind of what's going to be there, where is it going to fit, where are we going to put the advertising? Where's the, where's the main branding going to be? The links, all of those things. And this really enables the client to really evaluate this without getting distracted with things like, I, I really don't like this color blue that you're using here. So then once we have that, we can dive into the style guide. This is a key design deliverable. Uh, and this is generally an annotated document that describes the layout, the branding, the typography, navigation. There's going to be media and other elements. We talk about all those different things. We talk about each of them distinctively because uh, they will often be reused in different sections of the site. Uh, we're working with a content management platform. We're working with Drupal. And, what we, and we can reuse content. That's one of its strengths. Uh, we can reuse pieces of functionality, and we want to make sure that when that uh, piece of content or that piece of functionality is repeated in another part of the site, it's being done in a way that looks and feels like it's part of the site. It's not just bolted on. So let's take a look at the home page. Uh, so this is uh, what we've done. This is uh, kind of the full, this is a, a layout of the home page. Uh, we've got the branding in there, we've got the colors, we've got the full typography, we put in some mock ads. Uh, this is also in the, um, in the style guide where we talk about things like spacing, uh, how elements are separated. So I don't know if you can see it, but there's, actually, there's a grid here. It's both a vertical grid and a horizontal grid. So we're not just concerned with things like what the page width is, we're also concerned with something we call vertical rhythm. As you scroll down the page, you know, you don't want uh, different elements to be spaced differently from each other. You want everything to look like a designed and, and consistent experience, even if you have no idea what content is going to be going in there. So we've got our, we've got our, our deliverables from Act 1. Now we jumped into Act 2, right? Development. Development, this is the, the kind of main section. This is the biggest part of the project where uh, all the different players are involved in, in progressively building out the features and functionality of this project. Uh, of course, in a version controlled development environment. Uh, one really great way to kind of get started is to leverage uh, base installations or distributions um, and, and theme frameworks. Uh, we use Zen, other folks use other uh, uh, frameworks. 
but it gives you a baseline to start from. And uh, so you're not reinventing the wheel. And we'll talk a little bit more about the elements that make up a good platform in a little bit. But during this phase, you're iterating frequently. You're pushing code to the client staging environment on a predetermined schedule so they can uh, review this. Uh, these are regular code drops. If we're talking about films, you can think about it like uh, dailies uh, on a film. They will uh, shoot the scenes for a particular day. They'll go back and print them. They'll review them uh, in, the, uh, in the studio uh, that evening as they're uh, preparing for the next day's shoot. And they'll say, yeah, did this turn out OK? Do we need to maybe tweak some things? Uh, and they'll be able to make those kinds of decisions on the fly. You have daily project scrums with the team, very brief, short meetings uh, where you kind of touch base uh, on the status of the project. Um, this this should, meeting should not take more than 15 minutes. Uh, if you ever hear somebody say, I just came out of a 45 minute scrum, that wasn't a scrum, that was a meeting. <laughs> um, and you wanna report back to the client uh, with uh, at least weekly status reports. Um, you know, uh, generally most clients, particularly on larger projects, wanna know what the burn rate is. How are we doing? Are, are we, um, how are we tracking against time? How are we tracking against budget? And the key players you have at this stage are the tech lead, um, front-end developers who are, who are kind of new players in this phase, uh, project manager, who's the same project manager that we've had throughout, and of course the strategists and designer who are still involved, who are still available uh, to answer questions and to validate assumptions and to make sure that we're proceeding on the right track. So I don't have any uh, pictures of anyone like doing code. I think we kind of all know what that looks like. Um, but I did want to show a um, picture. This is a uh, project plan. This is something you should have before going into this phase. Uh, so we've got this divided out uh, into uh, the different weeks of the project. This is a 10 week project. Uh, we've got the different uh, players here. We've got design, we've got some uh, We've got developers and we've got different component developers for different aspects of the project, themers, quality assurance, uh, both on the developer side and on the client side um, who are going to be involved, uh, bug fix, documentation, training, the whole thing. And this is, this is kind of the master plan for the development process. And then here's a sample burn report. So you can see uh, you know, we've got so many hours allocated for this project. Uh, here's how many hours we've been spending on it during each of these uh, time periods. In this case, we're tracking by month. So uh, we've got a budget of 854 hours. Uh, we've used 637. Uh, we've got 217 left. We think we're gonna need about 153 hours, which means that at this point in the project, it looks like we're coming in about 63 and a half hours under budget, which is great. Um, and uh, what this means is the client has a good sense this project is uh, on track, on schedule. Um, you know, there's no promise that we're actually gonna come in at the end. We might run into some issue uh, in QA or toward the end of the development process that might eat up some of those extra hours. Um, if we don't, that's, um, that's great as well. Um, you know, and we're also tracking against um, the, different, um, the different roles in the project um, as well. So, uh, you know, we can see how many hours we're spending on project planning and management, how many hours we're spending on design, how many hours we're spending on development and QA. And, um, and we have different buckets that have been authorized for each of those line items. And, um, and you can actually see we're, we're actually, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, in this particular project, we actually went 23 and a half hours over on design. Fortunately, we've been coming in under on some of these other uh, buckets. Um, you know, plus we have a contingency bucket, which is kind of the um, bucket for things we didn't expect. Um, and that's something that's really useful to have in a project and to make sure you're very transparent about that uh, because no project actually goes exactly as planned. So then we jump into act three. Um, after, we, after we're done with this development phase, we've been 
progressively building stuff out, we get to a beta. Beta is a feature complete version of the site. It's not launched yet. Uh, it's still living um, in the client's staging environment. Um, but this is the point where we're going to kind of go back and validate and check and make sure everything is working the way it's supposed to work. So this is a, a good place where we're uh, populating content. Uh, having clients populating content on a beta site is a really great way for them to do some quality assurance testing to get used to the site. Uh, if they're having trouble understanding how something works, this is a really good opportunity to answer those questions. Um, and you're continuing to refine the front and back end based on feedback. You're validating that the site meets your design, functionality, and business goals, providing the client with orientation, training, and documentation. And at some point, when everything is, is happy, you're going to move from, um, if you've been working out of a development environment, you're going to move the authoritative version of the site to a staging environment. Um, and then after we fully completed this QA process and everyone signed off and everyone's ready for launch, that's when you're going to either launch the site uh, from the staging environment or move it to a final production server. Um, key personnel, this looks pretty familiar at this point. Tech lead, strategist, designer, project manager. Um, you know, important to bring back um, your strategist and designer and, and really make sure, because they're the folks who've been most involved at the beginning in Act 1, and have them come back and take a look and say, hey, you know, are, are, we, are we hitting our marks here? Is this site actually doing what we intended it to do? Which is a question that I find actually doesn't get asked often enough. Um, but it's kind of an important one. So um, for quality assurance tickets, uh, we, use, um, we use software called uh, Redmine. Uh, other folks use uh, other programs. Um, we, we've tried a bunch of them. The one that works best for us is Redmine. Um, and here's a sample QA ticket. Uh, this should be a familiar kind of quality assurance issue, hopefully to most folks. Search text is not vertically centered in Internet Explorer. What a surprise. Uh, so um, what this does is uh, actually our strategist uh, was the one who filed this ticket. Uh, he was going through and looking at the site and doing some validations. He noticed this issue. Um, you know, properly speaking, it's actually a design issue, but anyone can file a ticket if they notice something is out of whack. Um, so this was assigned to one of the front-end developers. Uh, we had an you know, estimate that this would take about an hour to fix, took about an hour to fix. Uh, we, we talked about the page. This was the, a home page issue. Uh, the URL in our, um, in our uh, QA environment where we were seeing it. Uh, there was actually a screenshot attached and a description of the issue in the browsers in which it appeared. Um, and so he had a really good understanding of what this issue was and was able to fix it. And so, of course, let's go back. This is, you know, what the final uh, version of the site looked like. This is the live version of the site that I took a screenshot from yesterday. So, um, this is this is the basic process, right? Uh, and it was hopefully kind of familiar, and it and it's it's awesome, right? Uh, except for one small issue, which is that. Life is actually a lot more complicated, and projects are often a lot more complicated um, and messy. And a really great analogy I've found for this is something called uh, the sleeper curve. Uh, so a guy named Steven Johnson wrote a book a few years back called Everything Bad is Good for You. And the premise of this book is that movies and TV and video games and all these things actually help make people smarter. And one of the examples he used for this, and talking about how popular culture has gotten more complicated and more interesting over time, uh, is if you take a look at the number of plot lines in a show like Starsky and Hutch, for example. Starsky and Hutch has basically one main plot line with a little comedic subplot that pops up at the beginning and the end. But otherwise, it's a very self-contained thing. We stick with the same characters throughout. There is one main story. Very digestible. In the 80s, you have Hill Street Blues come along. Hill Street Blues has a whole bunch of characters all over the place uh, who are involved in doing all sorts of different things. And they have uh, often overlapping interactions with each other. And there's multiple threads and plot lines and things going on at once. When this happened, it came out in the 1980s, the television producers were scared out of their minds that people would 
be confused and not understand this program. Um, but they did, and it was a huge success. And it showed that audiences had the capacity to process more than just a single plot line at once. And then in the 90s, we move on to The Sopranos. And The Sopranos looks a lot like Hill Street Blues. If you take any given episode, right, you've got all sorts of different characters. Um, what, you, what you actually see here in a general episode of, of The Sopranos is actually not only do you have the same number of plot lines going on, but instead of them being all split up, they're actually overlapping each other. So you have multiple overlapping, interacting plot threads. And what this doesn't show is that you actually have this going on, not just within a single standalone episode, but you have plot arcs that are extending over an entire season, or even in some cases, multiple seasons of the television program. So it's a lot more complicated. And as I was thinking about this, it reminded me of the development process. And the point here is that when you're working on a large, complicated web project, you often have multiple tracks running simultaneously with different players on different parts of the project. It's not just a single person running throughout the entire process. You, it's a whole team with developers, designers, strategists, QA people who are coming in and out of the project and have roles of varying sizes at different points in the project. So it's gotten a lot more complicated. It's not just a single three-act structure anymore. So that brings me to the idea of non-submersible units. What are non-submersible units? Uh, it's a storytelling technique uh, that you see in some films. Uh, the person kind of most responsible for uh, pioneering it um, is uh, director Stanley Kubrick, who did 2001, Clockwork Orange, The Shining, um, lots of kind of uh, well-known kind of cult films. Um, it's also used by Russian filmmaker, um, was used by Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky, um, and also Quentin Tarantino uses it uh, quite effectively in films like Pulp Fiction and Kill Bill. Uh, the idea is that you take the narrative and you, you split it down into six to eight independent essential story parts. And you could actually take each one of these story parts, these non-submersible units, and you could actually watch it as a standalone vignette. It tells a little story inside itself. But when you string it together in a logical order with other story parts, it makes up a larger narrative. And the audience is trusted to be able to make the connections between them. So to illustrate this, let's take a look at the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. And uh, in 2001, um, I've identified uh, half a dozen non-submersible units here. Th these are the ones I think exist. Um, other folks uh, believe that there's a different set of units, but these are the ones I like. Um, and 2001 Space Odyssey is basically boiled down into these parts. You have the very first part of the film, The Dawn of Man, which is about these uh, prehistoric, um, you know, proto-human ape creatures who are uh, struggling to survive. They're visited by a monolith from outer space. Uh, and uh, which basically helps prompt them uh, to, to reach the next step in their evolution. They learn how to make tools. When they learn how to make tools, then they're able to prevail uh, and, and survive and thrive. We then jump cut from these scenes that are taking place four million years ago in the African savanna to the near future, where we see spaceships and space stations and a journey to the moon with a space bureaucrat uh, who's going to the moon and he ends up because it turns out that, he, that he's discovered a monolith on the far side of the moon. And when the monolith on the far side of the moon is exposed to the sun for the first time, uh, it emits uh, this loud piercing uh, signal uh, that's beamed out into space. We then jump again uh, a few months later to the spaceship Discovery, which is on a journey to the planet Jupiter. And on board that spaceship, we've got several human uh, crew members. Uh, Frank and Dave are kind of man in the ship. Uh, we've got a few more uh, crew members in stasis. And we have a crew member who is uh, an artificial intelligence computer, the HAL 9000. And um, so we kind of get to know those, uh, those folks. 
Well, we then have an issue because um, Hal makes a mistake. And Hal's not supposed to make mistakes. And so Frank and Dave kind of get together uh, in, a, in a pod. They think they're out of, out of hearing. And they plot to disconnect Hal because if he's making mistakes, he's not reliable. They can't trust him to run the ship. Well, it turns out um, Hal uh, observes that conversation, understands what they're saying, and um, basically goes berserk. And uh, so he, uh, he decides to, um, to kill them, basically. And uh, so then, then the, the rest of that story is about them, uh, as about one of the crew members uh, basically overcoming this, this threat from the HAL 9000 uh, and, and uh, prevailing over him. We then arrive at Jupiter, where it turns out that there is another monolith in orbit around the moons of Jupiter. And um, Dave, our, um, our protagonist, uh, gets into a pod, and he's transported uh, across space and time into uh, a mysterious uh, visual special effects uh, place, for lack of a better term. And when he arrives at the end of his journey, it's in a very strange uh, uh, kind of cold-looking hotel room where he is mysteriously transformed into a star child. So each of these things, you can watch kind of each one of these vignettes on their own. Um, but they also make up a single narrative. And it's a narrative that is patched together. And audiences are trusted to make the connections. They're trusted to make the leap from 4 million years ago to the near future. Uh, this was actually something a lot of audiences and critics had a problem with. They had difficulty with when the movie came out in 1968. And when 2001 came out, it's, it's a universally uh, uh, regarded uh, by critics as kind of a masterpiece today. When it came out, critical opinion was really, really split on this film. Some people were like, I don't understand it. It's total junk. Um, but then they went back and watched it again. And a lot of these critics actually changed their reviews and recanted. They went back, and you know what? They're like, the first time I saw this, I didn't get it. I thought it was crap. And then I watched it again, and I get it now. I understand what's going on here. And, um, and, and this is actually a really great, innovative film. And I think this non-submersible uh, unit uh, structure is actually really similar to a good, agile process. Uh, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of what agile means. Um, I, 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 I've seen uh, agile processes where uh, essentially it's treated as uh, let's, let's gather a whole bunch of requirements together and let's just kind of build them out till the client runs out of time or money or whatever. And whatever we have at the end of that, that's what they get. Um, I don't think that's a really great way to manage expectations or help the client achieve their business goals. To me, what Agile means uh, is about collaboration. And it's about breaking tasks down into small chunks, small standalone chunks that can be worked on in a logical order. You release the features progressively in cycles. So we are continuing with this idea of we're building on what we have built before. And, but the work is done by very small, very focused, very collaborative teams, very small little chunks. So to me, that's how you kind of tackle this problem of how do we deal with the really, really complicated projects where you have these multiple narrative threads going on. You break them down. You treat them as separate units. And you deal with them in a logical order. And you tie them together into the main project as a whole. So let's change gears a little bit. Let's go through every James Bond movie in 30 seconds. Are we ready? All right, so we have the opening pre credit sequence where uh, James Bond is in some kind of uh, action sequence. Uh, we then jump into the opening credits, which usually have these kind of animated backgrounds going on that usually feature guns or girls or girls and guns. Uh, we start the main movie. Uh, Bond gets a mission from M. He flirts with Miss Moneypenny. He pick up, picks up some gadgets from Q or R. Um, he travels to an exotic remote locale. 
he meets up with a friendly foreign agent who's often named Felix Leiter. There's a chase sequence. He ends up meeting a, a, a bad guy who's got a plot, uh, who's tending to take over the world. Uh, Bond ends up defeating the villain, blowing up his lair, and then he makes love to the girl. The end. That is every single James Bond movie. There have been, I think, what, 20 or 22 Bond movies made in the last 50 years, and almost all of them exactly follow this plot. Uh, and they've made something like $12 billion at the box office. So why do we keep going back and watching the same damn movie over and over again? Why does this work? Well, for a few reasons. One, you can, you can add new characters and settings and situations into the formula. So it's a little bit different each time. The movies evolve over time to mirror real life events in our own world. So back in the 60s and 70s, Bond was fighting against the Soviet Union and communism and Spectre and all those things. Today, you know, uh, he might be dealing with, um, in the 90s, uh, he was dealing with media tycoons and the North Koreans and other threats of the time. It changes over time given the realities of the world we, we live in. It's a mirror. The formula isn't, isn't necessarily set in stone. It can still deliver some twists and turns. So, you know, I, I said at the end, you know, he makes love to the girl. Sometimes the girl dies. That's happened a couple times. Um, but ultimately, the Bond franchise delivers an experience that meets audience expectations. When you go to see a Bond movie at the movie theater, you know what you're, what you're going to get. You generally know what kind of movie it's going to be. You don't go in expecting a romantic comedy. You go in expecting this kind of movie, action sequences and intrigue and exotic locations and all of those elements. And it occurred to me, this is very similar to the elements of the successful Drupal platform. Uh, Drupal itself is a platform, um, but a lot of folks, as I said before, when you build it, you start off with not just core Drupal that you download from drupal.org, but you start off with a configured version that's got your most common modules and features and different things already kind of set up and pre-configured. That might be a distribution that you get from somewhere. That might be an installation profile. That might be something that you create yourself. It doesn't matter. Uh, the point is, though, if it's going to be successful, it should be customizable to meet specific use cases. You could have a Drupal platform that's, you know, meets 80% of the needs of a given uh, audience use case, but there's always going to be a certain percentage that's going to need to be customized to meet very specific and custom business needs. You can add to and extend it over time. That's Drupal, right? It's this very modular platform. Uh, we can. We can download new things, we can update modules, we can, we can update it, we can add it, we can expand it, we can, if when new web technologies come out, uh, they can be fit in. You can use it in non-obvious ways, right? Out of the box, Drupal is this kind of, you know, website publishing platform, but um, you can use Drupal for all sorts of crazy, weird, odd things. And it's one of the reasons actually you know, I like working with Drupal, uh, is that we do a lot of sort of weird things uh, where we're being asked to integrate all sorts of different third-party systems for colleges or uh, digital asset management systems for museums or media organizations. And Drupal is that kind of like magic glue that you can use to bring together all of these diverse systems into a single unified interface. And it delivers a consistent experience experience that meets users' expectations. So when you log into, when you're responsible for administering your Drupal site, uh, it should look and feel a particular way, and it should enable you to update your site and to accomplish the tasks that you're trying to accomplish. So that's what I have. Thank you very much, and I have left some time for questions. Um, I don't know if there are any mics out in the room or not, um, but if not, I guess raise your hand and I will call on you. Yes? I'll try to be loud. 
Okay. Ah, so that's a good question. The question is, uh, what's the difference between the Drupal development process and the uh, general web development process? I think it's similar in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we were working with um, other platforms uh, and, and, and kind of making our own for about 10 years before we started working with Drupal. Um, and I would say, in general, that kind of three-act structure that we talked about earlier in the process, um, you know, with some tweaks and changes, that's a very generalized structure for web development in almost any different platform. Uh, what Drupal enables us that's a little bit different uh, is the ability to kind of start out with that base to really, it, it does, it is a platform that I think fosters um, agile development um, to a certain point. You're not reinventing the wheel, you're not building new things from scratch as often. Um, you might be, if you've got a project that calls for, hey, this project needs a new module for X or Y or Z or whatever. Um, but in general, you can kind of leverage work that's come before. You can take existing modules. You can integrate them. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we, we like it a lot, um, you know, is obviously the strong community support and the ability to, to uh, integrate with other third-party systems. So, you know, when you're, when you're working in general web development, uh, you might either be working with a platform that, that has that kind of support, or you might be in a position where, you know, you're building it uh, entirely from scratch. At that point, you know, if you're gonna try to do agile development, you have to have a really, really strong process built around it, uh, because otherwise it's just gonna kind of spiral out. Drupal has really, great uh, standards for the way that things should be built uh, some, and best practices. And if you follow those, um, you're gonna end up with a really robust product. I think that's not gonna break if something needs to change six months down the road. Yes? Right. They have no expectations on it or, or the expectations are not realistic. How do you manage your customers? Or how do you teach or train or get them involved in your, in your project so that you can do successful projects with successful project owners? Right. So the question is um, how do we take um, customers who might not be used to an agile process? Uh, how do we manage their expectations and get them involved uh, and understanding what the process is? Uh, for us, it is, um, it is about talking about it a lot up front um, and, and kind of helping them understand what the roadmap for the project is gonna be. It's also about um, as much transparency as possible. And um, that one is, is, you have to be a little bit careful with that one um, just because too much information can kind of overwhelm the customer sometime. And, and, and when you're working in an agile process, that's a real danger. Um, what we usually do is we try to, in the beginning part, in that first act, in the discovery process, try to understand what the customer's level of comfort is. Um, some, some customers are gonna want to see, like, you know, we have customers who want daily code drops. And, um, you know, and they've got teams on their end that are very involved in the development process and are, you know, uh, are, 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 are up to speed on it. Um, we have other customers who are just kind of like, here's what I want, come back to me when it's done. Um, usually we try to, to hit somewhere in the middle so they can see work in progress. I think um, having those regular status calls uh, you know, with the client saying, okay, here's where we're at, um, here's, here's what we're building right now, here's what we have built, Here's what we're going to be building next. That's really helpful and useful, and it helps the customer kind of understand what the trajectory of the project is gonna be. I don't think you need to get into um, kind of a whole discussion of like the philosophy behind Agile and you know comparisons to Waterfall and all these, you know, you don't wanna to get too technical. You just really wanna say, hey, you know, 
here's how we're going to build this for you. Here's how we're going to maximize our efforts to enable you to get you know, the most bang for the buck or to allow you to launch your site um, you know, by this particular drop dead date. And uh, we're going to continue to have conversations about it uh, throughout the process. And in, you know, have, if you have questions, ask them. Um, you know, and we have, we have clients who, who come to us in the process and say, I don't, I don't really understand what's going on here. Can you help me? And, um, you know, so we do that. And we say, okay, no, we got to have a call. You know, <laughs> let's, 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 let's refresh you again on, on what the process is and make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, but yeah, that, that's all about lots of, lots of good, consistent dialogue and communication. And that's where um, having somebody who is uh, kind of a direct customer contact, uh, you know, a project manager is usually that person. Um, you know, a strategist or a, a, a technical lead can also be that person depending on the kind of uh, questions that are being asked. Um, so that they know, you know, that they have a person that they can talk to, um, that, there, that there are people running the ship, as it were. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I didn't want to get into too much detail about the tools because everybody's got a different set of tools that they're comfortable with. And depending on the scope of the project that you're working on and the makeup of the team that you have, a different set of tools is going to be what you're most comfortable with. I mean, my, my personal philosophy is, is, is use what you're comfortable with. I can tell you the tools uh, that we work with. Um, for um, so so for generating those burn reports, those yeah those are spreadsheets. The information for them uh, comes out of um, the Redmine ticketing uh, system that we have for each ticket, um, which is integrated with uh, Toggle, which is an online time tracking tool. Uh, so we built a bridge between those two systems, and that allows us to uh, do really great reports that tie time spent on a project to a specific ticket or deliverable. Um, in terms of wireframing, um, I'm not sure what we're using for wireframing right now. I know that we have used, Omnigraphle. we're using OmniGraffle right now. Thanks, Tiffany. Tiffany is uh, uh, co-owner of Palantir. Um, so yeah, OmniGraffle, I think we've even used, um, I think we've even used ImageReady sometimes. I know folks use that. Um, you know, Illustrator, but that, that's an awful lot of overhead if you're just trying to do simple uh, wireframes. Um, you know, I, I've seen wireframes that folks do that are, you know, just kind of literally paper sketches, um, you know, but uh, with our process, we like something digital. And I think there was a question right behind. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so I, I, for the discovery process, you mean? Yes, yeah. So um, I think that's becoming a, a more accepted uh, practice. Um, it was definitely something that was a lot more difficult to explain to clients uh, or prospective clients uh, a couple of years ago. Say, okay, so you're going to hire us and. Uh, we're going to spend this big chunk of hours planning, and at the end, you're going to get basically, and the way I would describe it is you're basically going to kind of get a set of blueprints, right? So if you, you know, want to build a building, um, you know, you don't, you don't have the builders start building without an architect drawing up a set of blueprints first. And that's a service that you pay for, right, that's distinct from the process of physically building your building. Um, but I think that, that increasingly uh, clients are understanding, uh, particularly as, as the projects get larger in scale, uh, understanding that we need to set aside some time um, to have professionals come in and do the business analysis, do the technical analysis, um, and deliver that first. And what we actually sometimes do um, is we will include along with the discovering strategy um, design will also be part of that initial engagement. 
so that at the end of the process, the client will not just get, you know, a sheet of paper or it's a, a rather a rather large, thick volume with a whole bunch of stuff written on it. Uh, they will also get some, um, you know, design concepts that they can take back and show. And that's really useful, um, I think, if you're dealing with organizations that uh, have stakeholders who are not as involved in the process, if they're executives or board members or whatever, you know, who, who hire, they're like, oh, we've hired a firm, right? And uh, so then they can, they can see at the end of the process, oh, this is what our new site is going to look like. Um, and so that is, um, that is a helpful deliverable for uh, those folks as well. Um, but um, but I, I've seen that be less and less of an issue. I, I think that folks are, are really kind of coming to understand that, um, you know, especially if they come in like, well, we have this idea for this thing and we want to do this and that, but we don't really know how it would work. Can you help us out? They're, they're more often willing to, to, you know, pay for that consulting and strategy. So, so, so the question is about, do, do we basically provide the full proposal? Usually what we do um, is we will provide, um, yeah, because they'll, they'll issue an RFP for the whole project. Uh, what we will do is provide, we'll go through and we'll talk about our entire process throughout. Uh, we'll talk about what we think, uh, uh, you know, what we're hearing from the RFP that the site needs, where the project needs. And you know what features you know we can have experience developing and everything. Uh, we will provide kind of a fixed bid for the um, engagement process or estimate for the engagement process. Then we will also often go in and say, if we can, uh, we will go in and say, and we're looking at overall what you've asked for, and here's a ballpark range for what we think the entire project might be. Um, one thing that we find is that as you get into uh, that early part of the engagement process, and sometimes even in the, um, in the uh, uh, contracting process, uh, we find that the clients you know, will say, well, this is our budget. This is what we have allocated for this project. And uh, if you know what that budget is, then you can uh, craft a solution around that that enables them to achieve their primary business objectives, even if they don't immediately get everything in that big laundry list. So, um, you know, that's, that's just a, a process of, of helping the client understand what your process is, understand what your capabilities are, um, and, and, and helping them understand that you understand what it is that they're trying to achieve. No uh, in the middle back there, middle right there, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a really interesting question. So the question is about um, would you skip wireframing and go right into prototyping? Um, I, I think that um, that's a question, that's a very valid question. I think that's a question that's going to come up more often as we start moving into uh, very responsive websites, uh, the kind of uh, uh, sites that um, actually John Albin is talking about right now uh, where you have uh, a single site that um, is responsive, the layout and the design changes depending on the device that you're looking at, the capabilities of the device that you're looking at. Uh, so um, we had a project uh, recently uh, where we actually did do that, where we kind of skipped, well we had, we had some initial wireframe concepts, um, but then we really did just kind of jump into the HTML prototypes. Um, and it worked, um, it was, we found a lot more time consuming, um, but what it did enable us to do is have a very responsive site design uh, that we would not have been really easily able to achieve if we were trying to do half a dozen different versions of a, of a wireframe for the same page uh, based on you know whether I'm looking at it on an iPhone or whether I'm looking at it on an enormous monitor. So I, I, I think that 
is a question um, that's going to depend on the kind of project that you're working on. I think it's going to depend on what the needs of the projects are. In general, I would still say the vast majority of projects, wireframing is the best standard. Um, you know, but there are definitely situations where that might not be true. Sure. It was reusable, most of it was reusable in our case because the person developing the prototypes was an experienced Drupal themer uh, who was very fully intending to reuse that markup uh, in the Drupal site. If it had been somebody who was not familiar with Drupal theming, somebody who was just mocking up a HTML prototype in Dreamweaver or BB Edit or whatever, it would not have been reusable. Um, so fortunately in that case it was because we had somebody who is really uh, experienced with Drupal theming um, creating those prototypes. Um, but it very easily, and, and not all of it was, I mean most of it was. Uh, there were you know, some technical decisions that we made during the implementation process that meant that we couldn't use all of it. But um, we were able to use the vast majority of the CSS at least. So. And I think, am I out of time? Yeah. OK. One more question. One more question. OK, right there. I believe, I believe that um, all the presentations will be available on video, will be available um, downloadable versions of the slides. Um, that's part of the plan. I know that I've already had to provide an early draft version of my slides, so um, I think you'll see a final version on the site, hopefully within days. So, so thank you very much, everyone. Don't forget uh, to fill out the feedback survey. I can tell you, as both as a speaker and as a, a former DrupalCon organizer, having really great feedback and evaluations for every session is super, super valuable when trying to uh, plan programming for future DrupalCons. So please go to the website and fill this out. Thanks a lot.